All right, so let's start. How are you guys doing? Everything okay? You had a good break? Mm -hmm. Yes, I hope that uh, now you're charged up to, to finish this class and to finish the final project. And we have one more wiki project to talk about. So I was taking a look at, uh, at the weekly projects and I realized that I had forgotten to upload the assignment for problem number seven. I mean, I gave the assignment, but didn't tell you where to upload it. So did you guys all finish this one? Mm -hmm. You have it somewhere, I hope, in your, uh, in your computer. So please just go ahead and, and download it at your earliest convenience, and uh, so we're done with it. So just as a reminder, number seven was about overpressure and plastic deformation. All right, so uh, then that's good, number seven. Uh, number eight is going to be the new one. And I have copies for that. Uh, can you please pass, keep one, pass two, David, please. Same for you, Toma. And Jack, you're fourth year. That's one. Okay, so this is problem number, uh, project number eight, and it's related to hydraulic fracturing. Let's talk, let's start talking about uh, applications, and then, then we'll come back to theory again. In this wiki project, uh, you have two parts. Let's start with the second part, because you already know how to do that. The second part involves uh, using the equations of the PKN model in order to predict fracture, half length, width, and net pressure with time. So uh, let me get here. All right. So if you remember, we talked about the PKN model. And uh, this is a model that allows you to predict what is how a fracture with this geometry is going to grow as a function of time with a constant injection rate. So the problem I'm giving you for example, uh, already what is the fracture height, what is the total injection rate. Uh, be careful with that one because that's for two wings and the model is for one wing. So you will have to di divide this one uh, by two. So from here you get the injection rate and uh, you have viscosity and that's pretty much everything you need. And you just use the solution to the PKN model and with, actually you have the questions right there, with those equations you will be able to uh, compute what is the Fracture have length width and net pressure. Yes. Um, what is an MPI? It's a million. That's uh, a million. those are field units. So double capital M, it's uh, a million. So in this case, uh, let me check what the number is. Uh, where was that? Here. Mm -hmm. So this is. 8.9 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Okay. Yeah, n now, especially now with uh, uh, data, data science and, you know, using the conventional K for a thousand, M for a mega, and so on, it, it's kind of confusing to use All right, um, and I 
think those, that's everything. Something that I recommend that you do is that before you start putting those numbers in here, make the right unit conversion first and pass everything either is, if it's in field units or not, pass it uh, to the SI system with meter, kilogram, and second. And from here also you get Newton and you get Pascals and uh, meter squares or meter cube and so on. But first do that because otherwise doing is going to be, to be quite difficult, it's going to be messy. You see that there are many powers, and and it's going to be it's going to be very complicated. So, put everything into the SI system, and with meter, kilogram, and second, and the combined units of that. And here you will get answers in meter. Here you will get in meter too. Then you convert it to something that makes more sense. If you want it to millimeters or inches or whatever. And this one, the answer will be in Pascals. And then you can change that one to uh, PSI or megapascal or something that makes more sense. All right? So do the unit conversion first and then uh, use the equation. And just a, a clarification for the last point, I'm not actually asking you to write an algorithm for that or to code it in MATLAB. But, but just, you know, if you had LICO, what's the equation? What equation in uh, the ones that we have seen that go into predicting the growth of a fracture, like for example, would this equation change? If you have LICO, would this equation change? Or would that one change what you, you would do in order to incorporate LICO? Uh, I mean, you can go very complex, but you can do some approximations, easy ones, that uh, uh, today. But uh, problem number two uh, is, is relatively easy. And uh, just use equations to predict length, width, and net pressure. One more thing I wanted to say here is that pay attention to the ratio of this, to the ratio of width at the wellbore and fracture length. And you will realize that how thin or how tender these fractures are, these are usually in the, ter in the range of 1 over 1,000. So that means that if you have a width of 1, your length is going to be a thousand. And that means that that's something very thin compared uh, to the length. And also keep an eye on what is the absolute value of the net pressure. Because we're going to see today that we can compare that to S2 minus S3 and this could be smaller or larger than that. And that's going to uh, affect the, the shape of the hydraulic fracture. And that's where we're going now. OK. So for this first problem, it's just a single fracture problem. And these equations have been used for a long time. Uh, they are relatively old. And single fracture hydraulic uh, simulators have the same physics that we saw in here, but a fracture height that might vary with uh, the distance of the, of the fracture. So it's, it's not more just a fixed height, but it, it might change as you go further into the formation, or it might grow, or, or might grow or not, depending on the, what is the value of net pressure. But basically, it's just that cup, coupling fluid mechanics in the fracture with solid mechanics outside the fracture. Okay, so that's where the single 
The second part is related to a problem of having multiple fractures and how those multiple fractures could interact with each other. Um, and that's what we're going to see uh, today after we finish a, a few things. Um, and, and I'll come back to this, okay? So just to finish with the projects, um, um, in order to get organized, let me tell you what is, we just have one week left, and that's it. So on this project number eight is due on Monday. Um, for those of you that uh, you may submit a little bit later, Wednesday, that's not what it is. That's not an issue, okay? Uh, and uh, you, you do want to submit all your work uh, before the, the exam day, okay? And we, we didn't finish, and I don't think we're going to get to see the, the next thing, but if you are interested, and you want to continue doing weekly projects because you like them a lot, you can find the one that we didn't see, which is number nine over here. And here you will find all this data in the, I'm gonna be a little bit slow today. You didn't sleep very well. Uh, you will find it in the, in the GitHub repository. And you go to graduate homework, and then you will find the data where you have uh, a triaxial test in which uh, we measure uh, strains and simultaneously P and S waves. So you can see how those P and S waves, they change with time. And the objective is to measure at along the lo loading curve what is the static modulus, something that we already know how to do and compare that with and picking arrival times to tell what is the P wave and the shear wave and calculate the equivalent of the amp modules and Poisson ratio out of there. Again, if you want to know a little bit more about this, just let me know and I'll help you out. But that will be the end for the projects. And uh, so this one is the last one and it's, it's due next week, okay? Um, all right, any questions about the, the projects? So, no. Remember that our final project is on Friday. It's gonna be from four to seven, more or less. And uh, it's going to be, again, it's mandatory and it's going to be random. So I'm gonna pull out the Excel. I'm gonna order your names alphabetically and I'm gonna press like uh, random and multiply times the number of students and then uh, that's gonna, Excel is gonna tell who goes first and who goes last. So you should be prepared. Try to rehearse and try to make it in, um, in 12 minutes maximum, okay? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to cut you. And I, I sent the guidelines already, but you are uh, encouraged to ask questions because that's gonna be part of your grade, all right? Okay, so then, then this is done. And I have one more organization item. We're not going to have a regular lecture on Monday. Instead, I'm gonna have an invited special uh, lecturer uh, who is uh, a person that works in geomechanics in Equinor and he's gonna talk about uh, geomechanics and hydraulic fracturing. I'll send you the details of the of the, this special late, uh, lecture during the week. But, uh, but, but please come on Monday and uh, we'll have that special lecture, okay? Uh, so then Wednesday is gonna be the, the last day of the regular lecture. All right, okay, so I think we're good. Um, and continue. The last thing that we saw was 
the derivation of this PKM model, and then the extension and how this is going to be very similar with this PGD model. Uh, you can find the questions in my notes and the radial model. But it's just involving you assume a fracture shape and you assume fluid flow into the fracture and then that's pretty much uh, everything. But there is something here that, uh, that was assumed and that is not very realistic. I think we already talked about fracture height, right? We talked about, yes, we talked about how to determine fracture height. That was one of the main limitations of these very simplified models. But there is another one. Anyone think about what that could be? Uh, yes, yes, that, that's a, a, a limitation too because you're, we're, we're using plain stream models. But there is another one. Uh, yes, and uh, it's more related to the ro a rock property. Um, Yes, but it's, it's another one. Okay, let me let me stop playing uh, uh, hide and catch. Is that the name? Um, hide and seek. Hide and seek. So it's uh, we didn't talk much about what goes on into the pores of the rock, and we didn't talk much about lico. We talk a little bit about lico, but in the questions that that we discuss over here, number four. PKN model, there is no leak off term. And also there is no effect of what the leak off would do in the rock. The, the, for example, the Yam modulus doesn't change and uh, n nothing changes. It's, this model is basically assumed it's good for a very tight rock. But we know that there are some rocks that, that even if they are very tight, like shales, uh, they might have fractures, natural fractures for which we might have significant leak off. So there, there is nothing like no leak off. There is always some leak off. Um, and because of that, uh, you, we can extend some of this theory to fluid driven fractures in porous media. Uh, so far there is no book about this and uh, it's a relatively recent topic, but uh, you, you will find it mostly in papers. But if you're very interested in this topic, here I'm just talking, going to talk uh, very briefly ab about it. Uh, if you want to get into it and get to know more, I strongly recommend that you read the papers from uh, Emmanuel Detourne and, uh, and his students uh, and Emmanuel de Tournay is at the University of Minnesota. He has done, I always spell incorrectly Minnesota, it's too difficult. But, uh, okay. is that? Yeah. Two ends, that's it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wasn't that hard. So, uh, he has done a lot of work extending the work of hydraulic fracture for porous media and for poor elastic media. So he also includes the part of poor elasticity and how effective stress uh, would vary when you have uh, leak off. This solution that we saw here uh, with just considering a volume that goes into the fracture and another volume leak off, this is a very simple solution. It doesn't change anything about the mechanics. And actually when you do have fluid flow, it does have an impact on mechanics. And we'll come back to this later on. But ju just let me tell you in advance that leak off is going to favor the reactivation of natural fractures in shear, and that's going to favor micro seismicity. Uh, but le let's not get in into that right now. So here, the only thing I want to know, uh, I want to do is just conceptually think about these hydraulic fractures as 
a process that consumes uh, energy and uh, that energy can go into either uh, breaking the rock mostly or into viscous losses of the fluid going into the fracture mostly. So for example, if you had a material with uh, a fluid with high viscosity and a rock with low toughness, we will say that a fracture that propagates under that regime is a fracture which is a fluid driven fracture dominated by viscous losses. That means that most of the energy goes into viscous losses and the, the rock is just uh, too weak and the fracture just goes straight and it doesn't care about what the, the toughness of the, rock, of, the fra of the rock is. Everything just goes into flowing, uh, flowing fluids. On the other hand, the low viscosity with high toughness, most of your energy might go into breaking the rock. It's not going into flowing the fluid through the and in that case, that this type of regime is going to be a toughness dominated fluid driven fracture. So I hope that you notice from this schematic is that we're not talking about fractures in general. These are fractures which are opened by a fluid inside. The viscosity of the fluid is important. Toughness of the rock. And here we're going to add. Uh, one more variable, um, but before I do that, uh, let me tell you what this axis is. This axis will be creating new fractures and this will be the work that goes into circulating the fluid in the fracture. So the bigger the, the bigger the, the work required to create new fractures, the more to the right in this plot you are. And in the y-axis, we're going to add, we're going to quantify the volume of fluid the fluid and uh, this ratio is going to tell you uh, how much uh, fluid goes into the fracture opposite to how much leak off. For example, for, for this type of ratio, there is an efficiency factor that considers that, for example, a high efficiency, efficiency factor will be one in which just a little bit of fluid goes into the leak off and mostly goes into opening the fracture. From the point of view of making a fracture that will be more efficient because you need less fluid in order to open uh, that fracture. So in this type of diagram then, uh, something which is over here will be something that leak off a lot of fluid into the rock and this will be a leak off dominated fracture propagation and something which is down here, that loses just a little bit of fluid, is going to be an storage uh, dominated type of fracture. And that's, uh, that's very important because it tells us where the fluid goes. And uh, within this diagram, 
uh, your fracture propagation uh, could be anywhere depending on what are the properties of the rock, the properties of the fluid. Uh, but important too is uh, that, for example, you could change regimes if, for example, you change the viscosity of your fluid. Or you can change regimes if you change uh, what is the, the distribution of solids into your fracturing fluid. For example, for drilling applications, uh, sometimes you add something which is called uh, wellbore strengthening material that some people argue that helps, uh, that prevents leak off from fractures, from, from short fractures. So it allows you to increase your breakdown pressure. Um, but if you do anything to modify the leak off, for example, viscosity, or if you have a filter cake or something, you're going to move around this area and uh, varying the properties of the fluid, uh, you could change what is the type of uh, fracture propagation. Okay, something interesting out of here is that, um, for example, for it's interesting to look at this as a function of time. And as a function of time, for example, with time increasing in this direction, you can have pl planar fractures like, like KGD that will go, uh, will switch into storage dominated when they are short to leak of dominated when they are long uh, because you may have a, a material which is quite permeable and then uh, the, the amount of fluid that goes into the fracture uh, related to the amount of fluid that goes into leak off uh, might change. And this could be either in the viscosity dominated regime or in the toughness dominated regime. This type of planar fractures like KGD, usually they would stay uh, like that. They might not change in uh, the regime in this direction because they just have one tip that doesn't change with time. You remember KGD, it was like this. So if these fractures continues opening in this direction, this length of the tip is going to be always the same. So uh, the work required to to open this fracture uh, is going to be almost the same. It's going to depend on the length of the fracture, but this distance, the area that you're breaking is always the same. And that's not the same with uh, some other types of fracture, like for example, radial. A radial fracture can change from storage to leak off and from viscosity to toughness Can you can you think why that would be the case? Let me. What do you think? Uh, say again, Bethany. Yes. So in this case, the the area that you break is the same, but in penny shape. Let me see if I get this draw drawing correctly if you have a penny shape like this one the area of the tip now the tip is this entire region so this area is going to change with the fracture length or with the fracture, uh, in this case, diameter. So here, the tip uh, length is proportional to 
proportional to R, where R is the radius of the fracture. So the perimeter uh, would be uh, 2 pi R. And every time your fracture grows bigger and bigger, then uh, you're going to have even more surface to break. And that's why sometimes this type of fractures might go from viscosity dominated to toughness dominated because now every time you need more uh, work to create, uh, to expand the fracture because basically it's more rock uh, to break. So in order to uh, of fluid driven fractures in uh, in porous media and in fractured media, uh, something else that, that you have to do is you have to use effective stress instead of total stresses. Notice that so far we have been just using total stress. Um, what that assumes is that we have sort of a perfect filter cake at the face of the fracture so that we differentiate very clearly between the pressure in the fracture and the pore pressure. That can be true for relatively tight material, but for permeable material or whenever you have natural fractures, that's not going to be true anymore. So you need to consider effective stress. And also you need to consider leak off uh, rigorously. And that means uh, by using some, some sort of uh, fluid flow uh, simulation. And of course, well, with effective stress, also we need pore elasticity to account, for example, for undrained loading. And uh, when you, you know, when you put all of that together, then you're going to be able to uh, solve a problem of a hydraulic fracture propagation in porous media. For example, I think just in uh, last week, that, that's the, the first dissertation uh, I saw uh, from a student from Professor Sharma that was doing accounting for undrained loading in hydraulic fracturing. And, uh, and that, that, was, that was very nice to see, but often all of these effects are, are neglected and we, but we don't know very well what we are neglecting and if that's uh, important or not. All right, so uh, let's see how we're doing with time. I think we're doing well. Um, do you have any question about, about this part? Uh, again, I recommend that if you're interested in this topic, that you read this paper. Uh, for example, he has some solutions for I believe it's KGD, KGD propagation in, in pore elastic media, uh, extending the simple model to a, a pore elastic uh, solution. Can you just give me like multiple fractures? No, fractures? Very, very good point. These are single fractures, single planar fractures. Uh, right now, in order to understand what will be the effect of a non planar fracture and why we may have a non planar fracture. Yes, that's an Yeah. Very good question. I, I think I forgot to say that. Yes. The PTN, you use it generally for long fractures when your fracture half length is longer than your fracture height. Okay. And your KGD, uh, you use it, it gives better results for relatively short fractures when those fractures are shorter than the fracture height. Okay, and so in like a really thick paper, you probably use KGD? And it, it depends. What is going to be your fracture length? Right. I was just kind of thinking like that would be an interesting test, but it's not an interesting test. It, it 
it could be if your fracture is relatively short, probably you may use this, but even in, in very thick patients, mm -hmm. you can do uh, relatively long fractures too, usually higher than the fracture, than the fracture height. Uh, for, for conventionals, usually the fractures tend to be quite long, right. longer than the uh, height of the, of the patient. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk now about <coughs> multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. We have done already some of these drawings, but I'm gonna do it here again. If you have a single wellbore, and let's say that minimum principal stress is horizontal and coming in this direction. If you have a single wellbore, and you do a completion with a vertical wellbore, here, out of the single wellbore, you're just going to have one fracture. And And that, that is what it was done for a long time. Of course, this is a lot better than not having because it increases the surface area of the wellbore in contact with the rock uh, several hundreds of thousands of times. So the area of the fracture is a lot bigger than the area of the wellbore in contact with the rock. But recently, we have started to do horizontal wellbores that go into, into the basin for which uh, taking advantage of that single wellbore and having that horizontal, you can put uh, clusters of perforations and make several fractures. So uh, let's imagine usually this always starts from the, uh, I don't know if you guys know this analogy, but this is compared with the, with the foot, right? So this is the toe of the wellbore and somewhere over here, uh, you have the heel. And if you have several clusters, you can create, ideally, several fractures that we're going to assume planar right now, just to make it easier. And all of those are going to have some fracture length. And the benefit of this is not only that you increase what is the surface area of the rock in contact with the, with the wellbore, but also you shorten the distance between the, the wellbore or the fracture and the, and the rock itself. So for example, if let's say, so this is our block diagram, but if we do a top view, this is our horizontal wellbore. This is the top view, and we have two more or less planar fractures over here. Uh, if you had a molecular fluid which was sitting somewhere over here, before with no fracture, it had to go all the way to the wellbore. But now, with these fractures, then it can go either to the left or to the right, 
but just go directly to the fracture, and the, actu the fracture would act like a highway, take it through the fracture, and then take it to the wellbore, uh, to the surface. So at the end, the fracture is just going to be like a sort of a highway. Okay. Um, in this case, we're assuming no fracture interaction. And basically, in this case, what we're saying is all the fractures are planar. But that's subject to one condition. And one of the most important conditions is what is the distance between these clusters? And let's call that by LF. Uh, one of your design question now, it's uh, what is the distance between fracture? Because before it was fracture length, fracture height, and width. Now you have one additional variable. What do you think, what would you use as an optimal spacing between fractures? What would that depend on? Uh, and what, what would be the stress shadows, Rodrigo? Okay, so if if fractures, let's make another question over here. Let's do now. This is the top view. With uh, usually, how these. Uh, Fractures are done, or let, let's just start with a simple way. You would get to a location, plug this section. It was the same in this case. If you go in order, like one, two, three, four, you plug this section, then you pressurize this region and a hydraulic fracture propagates. You go to the next stage, you plug now that region, and if the fractures are too close, Rodrigo was saying the stress created by this fracture will affect the following fracture. Remember that, let's make a zoom of the tip. Remember that this is a fracture that after it has, it has closed, you have put propan on it. So it's a prop fracture. And, and now the rock is compressed in this direction of minimum principal stress more than what it was before because you have opened the fracture there and you have propped it and uh, now that has a higher compression than before. So if this fracture, which is now propped, changes the stress so that it is starts interacting with a new fracture, there are two things that can happen. One, the fracture might grow still straight but with no propant. The stress might inhibit the width of the fracture which is opening uh, next to it because there's too much stress. So the width now is, is higher, is, is smaller. The stress is higher. So for the same net pressure, you cannot open as much as you opened before. And let's say if the width is smaller than the propan si size, you're not going to have any propan in it. 
And the other thing that can happen is that this fracture can also turn because of the influence of the previous fracture. At some you have the minimum principal stress, but also you're going to have an additional stress. Let, let me write that in one line, otherwise it's confusing. There's going to be an additional stress that's going to make that uh, fracture uh, probably bend. This is one, one is two. And now, if, if you were to stop knowing that you try to create another fracture, now this one is even closer than the other one was before. So this one may even just go a little bit in this direction and grow more in the other direction. And if you put another one, it might, this might do uh, weird things and let us exaggerate a little bit more. stress that make your fracture even propagate mostly and go into the just keep uh, fracture dimension not to be planar anymore so uh, this is what is also called, uh, this term is, will be stress shadow. And this is what we want to calculate in, uh, in the project, uh, project number eight, the first question. Basically, we want to know what is going to be the additional stress imparted by a fracture and to see if that stress is going to be large enough so that, let's say in the far field, this is S3 looking from the top, and this is S2. The question is, what is the additional stress that I need so that what was before the principal stress now is equal or larger than what it was before the intermediate principal stress. When I get to that stress, then the principal stress direction is not going to be any more, S3 is not locally, it's not going to be any more in this direction, but is going to be in that direction. Just to make it clear here, let's open, let's put some a coordinate system. If your additional stress is too large, the minimum principal stress is going to go, instead of being east-west, is going to change north-south. And that's when you're gonna have your fractures to change direction and not to propagate in the way you want it and in the way that we presume will be the case uh, over here. All right, so how do we do this? And this is what we want to see uh, in the project over here. Let me explain you what, what you have in here. Uh, well, first of all, I encourage you to read this paper from where I took the, uh, this image and also, you have to get from here, uh, take a look at type table one. That's going to tell you what are the conditions at that location. And uh, 
using your code for free fem for the fracture, you're going to predict uh, what are going to be the increases of stress uh, due to putting a fracture and to see what is the point at which stresses would reverse. L let me explain what this is going to be. All right, what you see over here, this red line is a horizontal wellbore. This one is a fracture. And this one is a top view. Let's, uh, as you see the axis here, we have X, Y, and Z coming out of the page. So if we look at that in three dimensions, it's more or less like this. X, Y, and Z. And what, what you're looking at here is I'm just going to do one side of the fracture. It's a fracture which is something like this, where this point over here, that's the tip of the fracture. And it's that point over here. All right, so I hope now you have a better idea what you're looking at. Let me tell you what this is. All these lines are, are telling you what is the direction of S H max. So far from the fracture, where there is no effect of the fracture, this is the direction of SH max. And this is the direction of SH min. So you should expect a fracture uh, we are under normal faulting conditions, so this is S3 and S2. Um, right here, a fracture should always open perpendicular to SH mean, and that's this is what you see over here. But now, because of the presence of the fracture, after it propagated, the minimum horizontal stress is not pointing in this direction anymore, it's pointing in this direction. And for about 150 feet, the minimum horizontal, or let's do the maximum horizontal stress now goes in this direction, let's say east west, and outside of it, it's north south. So this is what I want you to calculate where the stress is reversed. And in order to do that, what, what you're going to have to do is to model that, but you're not going to model a 3D fracture. What I want you to model is uh, a 2D fracture. So this will be the 3D version. What they did in this paper, for a 2D version, we're just going to take the plane X, Z, and you're just going to model a plane strain condition where this is the height of the fracture divided by two. And don't worry about what the in situ stresses are. I recommend that you 
uh, divide the problem in two. Uh, just calculate what the additional stress are going to be for placing a fracture. So when you place a fracture here, if you want to calculate what the stress are going to be near this fracture at the center of the fracture, in this case, y equal to zero, then because of the presence of the fracture, you're going to have a change of stress in direction xx. So in your 2D model, this will be, you know how to do this. You already did it. It's just a stress caused by, by this fracture at, at a certain distance. So this is going to be delta S xx. And those are, that's going to be one of the horizontal components. And the other one that you have to calculate is the change in this direction, delta S yy. And delta S yy, you cannot see it here in the 2D version, but you can calculate it because you're going to be able to calculate also what is going to be the change delta S zz and delta S yy, assuming our plane strain conditions is going to be the Poisson ratio times delta S xx plus delta S uh, zz. And that's it. That's everything what you have to do. And uh, you add to the original conditions. Numbers are, well, let's see. I, th I think we have, we have some time. So I'll check it quickly. Let's see. This is, uh, I don't have the SP number. That would be useful. So you will see this is not very complicated. And if you had a, the capability of do a 3D simulation, you could redo entirely uh, this paper that, that was done about uh, a year, eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, if you use this equation, how can you calculate the minimal yy uh, stress? Is it possible to calculate the stress shadow using like the recent equation that you showed us? Like yes, but that one, uh, it didn't tell you, if I remember correctly, uh, it didn't tell you what was delta uh, zz. SCZ. That one was to calculate delta S XX. Uh, I'm, I'm probably you could do that too. I don't remember very well. Uh, but, uh, uh, you can try. If you find another solution for that, prob probably you could do it. And you can find an analytical solution for that. Um, I'm just, let, let me write this number. It's a paper number. And Check it out. So here you have the analytical solution, the one that you can do and also you can do it numerically. And let's see, conditions, conditions here. Okay, so the minimum principal stress is uh, 6,300. So in this particular problem, SH mean is 6,300 PSI, and SH max is equal to 6,400 
psi. And this is an example in which uh, this difference is particularly small, just 100 psi. That means if your net pressure is over 100 psi, you're already going to have reversal immediate to the fracture. And in general, the lower the lower the difference between S3 and S2, the smaller is going to be this additional stress that you need to make these changes in direction. So usually, uh, this difference, S2 minus S3, goes by the name of differential stress. When you have areas in which your differential stress is very high, you don't worry too much about stress shadowing or changes of fracture direction uh, because of uh, changes of stresses. But when you have a small differential stress, then the alterations that your fractures make on the local state of the stress could be enough to make these fractures go into direction uh, are not planar. All right, so let me see if I forget anything from here. No, I don't, I don't think so. Let me just uh, add a few notes over here. What will be the consequences? What will be the consequence of having this interaction? It's very easy to make these drawings. It's not easy to simulate these non-planar fractures. There has been a lot of research on what numerical methods to use to simulate uh, non-planar fractures. Some of the main problems related to this is that when you use a finite element or a finite method and you have a mesh, if you use some of those methods, usually your fracture you will follow. So whatever your mesh is, that's going to be the irregularity or the shape of your fracture. And, and that's why it, this is a, an easy problem. There are some other methods which are called meshless methods in which the fracture does not follow the mesh. It goes in the, the direction which it should actually go. But some of those are very computationally expensive and they're very difficult to run. And for a 3D simulation, they, they, they could take days in order to, to do uh, such simulation. So most commercial simulators, they just simulate planar fractures. That's the, the easiest thing uh, to, to do. Uh, so far, I don't know any commercial simulator that, that simulates these uh, non-planar fractures together with fluid flow and with um, all the problems of hydraulic fracturing. Probably the only one is uh, that I know is uh, Professor Sharma's one, that, but that, that one uses the mesh. So somehow it could be also affected by uh, what you use as a mesh. If you use a very fine mesh, again, uh, that's going to result in very long simulations. All right. Let's do uh, one more thing today. And... Uh, that's going to be uh, actually a solution for all these problems. Um, I, I, I just remember one more thing that I don't want to forget. What do you think is going to be the length between the fractures proportional to? 
in order to not to have interaction. So the, the bigger the, the for example, rock, the, in general, the bigger the stress shadow is going to be. So the stress shadow is going to be proportional uh, to your net pressure uh, and also to the width of the fracture. So e either those two are, are going to be uh, related and is going to be also related to the stiffness of the rock. The stiffer the rock, the also the longer are going to be, and uh, it's going to be inversely proportional to the height of the fracture. The shorter the fracture. Uh, which is in this case is the, the shortest length of this fracture in two dimensions. The shorter this distance, the shorter also the fracture shadow is going to be. And one more thing, and then, then we go to the next topic. The problem of <coughs> how close you put these fractures is a also a problem of economics. Let's forget for a moment fracture interaction. We know fra uh, fracture interaction, uh, it's very important. But also, you may say, I'm going to put these fractures very close. But if you put these fractures very close, uh, also the cost of doing such a hydraulic fracturing completion is going to be very high. Probably you will have higher production rates, but your cost is going to be very high. On the other hand, if uh, you space your fractures a little bit more, then you can find an, optipa, an optipa optimal number so that you have enough number of fractures so your production is more or less okay, but your cost of doing all those fractures, it's also relatively low. So in general, there's going to be a limit or a, a local minimum of net present value that maximizes production and minimizes the cost of completion. And that uh, length between the fractures and putting together fracture interaction, everything together, that is what is going to determine uh, that number. Okay, well, so far, we have doing a simplification, have been doing a simplification that was done several years ago at the beginning of multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. And that simplification is that we just pump in one cluster each time we plug a section of the wellbore. So for example, in, in this case, we just had one cluster here and we plugged it in here and pumped and created one fracture. And at the beginning, this was done like this, but it's not done like that anymore. Because people figured out that it will be easier. And I think more convenient from the point of view of energy also to have several clusters in the same plug region. So similar as before, you will have your horizontal wellbore, but now you can have several clusters within that region. And now you add one more variable, which is going to be the distance between the clusters or how many clusters per stage you put. So each of these is going to be a stage. And in each of those, you're going to have clusters.
Do you guys know what these clusters look like? It's more or less like, you know, you see that drawing over there of perforations in a wellbore? Yeah. It's, it's more or less like that. And in general, these clusters or, and these perforations are done in a sort of a spiral way around the wellbore. So if this one starts there, then there is another one somewhere over here, and another one somewhere over there, and so on. And, and they are not in the same plane, so they, they shift in length. Usually the angle between these perforations is about 60 degrees, and, uh, and the number of perforation per cluster, it's, it's a design variable. But let, let me, let, let's keep these details right now. What do you think would be the advantage of making a fracture grow from multiple clusters rather than one cluster? Any, any idea? Well, but I mean, you could have say put plugs here and there later, and you could achieve the same surface area if your fractures are the same, right? So, why faster? Well, yeah, probably that would be an operational advantage that instead of, you know, plugging a lot of sections, you just put several clusters and, uh, and then just plug it the entire stage and then you make the, the fractures grow. Uh, yeah, that could be one operational advantage. But from the point of view of fracture propagation and taking into account fracture interaction, Uh, why? Why would it add complexity? Um, because if you have multiple clusters going through, then you're going to influence the area of the thing. Y yes. Well, let, let me tell you a, a few more details uh, to, to help you uh, make uh, an answer about this. If you take a look at, at this paper from 2011, you will see that the the fracture distance between clusters proposed was relatively large in the order of hundreds of feet. And uh, we know that, that today uh, this distance between clusters are a lot shorter than that. It's not hundreds of feet. Even the distance between states is not, uh, is not that long. For example, Currently, in the Permian Basin, typical numbers would be that you can have a lateral with a length of more or less 10,000 feet. That's common, three kilometers. In this lateral, normally you have um, a few dozens of stages, 40, 50. So if that's the case, then stage length uh, will be what? It will be a thousand divided four. It will be 250 feet, right? So what we're saying here is that, look, compare this one to this one. Here we're already seen saying that if you have to put a fracture, it should be somewhere further than 200 feet, at least with this particular model. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that currently in the Permian, they are putting these stages spaced or more or less 
over 250 feet. And in each of those, in each stage, you will have four to 15 clusters. So we're saying that these clusters are spaced about all the way from uh, 50 feet to, let's say, 20, 15 feet, which is not, not a lot. And the uh, long, long story short is that many of the previous studies were uh, overestimating these stress shadows. And when you do this type of completion with several clusters, uh, you actually take advantage of the rock itself adjusting to whatever the rock wants to do. We know very well that rocks are not homogeneous, they are very heterogeneous, and therefore there might be regions in which a, a fracture may start growing over here and it may get longer, and if that one starts growing, uh, probably, let me do with color, Probably, if there is any fracture interaction, this one may grow not that much, but may grow into another direction. But then this one, it will grow in, into this direction, uh, and so on. Oh, not, not from there. That's a plug. But with this type of completion with several clusters, it's, you're, you're not telling the fracture to grow where, where you want the fracture to go, but rather, in this case, the fractures grow where they, they want to grow. And I, I like to see it also from the point of view of energy conservation, saying that in this type of environment, you really have the survival of, of the fittest. You don't know, you can't control which one is going to grow more because the rock is heterogeneous. And these fracture interactions also, you cannot control it very well. But if you give enough chances for the fracture to grow where the fracture wants to grow, then uh, it, it's just going to grow, but uh, according to the, where the fracture wants to grow and not where you want the fracture to go. Another thing to take into account in here is that, for example, if we are injecting in this direction, if in this direction we have the heel and in this direction we have the toe of the wellbore, in this type of model, when you do a hydraulic fracture simulation, you also have to model the fluid flow in the wellbore and as it goes through the perforations into the fracture because that's going to be part of the problem too. You might have that the initial fracture is taking more fluid than the others, or you might have that some of the fractures are taking more sand than the others. And although they might be propagating, some of them, they may not be taking sand. So that, that's going to be uh, a problem yet to solve. But in general, this is what is working the best right now. And, uh, and the, the way that uh, the operations uh, are done because I think it, it takes, it's more efficient from the point of view of taking advantage of the rock itself. Okay, so let me finish with this list. Uh, for each stage, you're gonna have about 60 to 20 perforations. Typical numbers for this hydraulic fracturing jobs in unconventionals require about 2,000 pounds of propant. I'm gonna put here a measure of length. What do you think is gonna be? Let's, let's think on field, in field units. How much, is, how much sand do you think you need? So 2,000 pounds is about a ton, right? So a ton is of sand per foot, per yard, per 100 feet, per mile. 
but then it says for 100 feet. Any other suggestion? So imagine a ton, a ton of sand, right? A ton of sand probably is like something like this big, a cube this big. And we have a 10,000 feet wellbore. So this is per foot, per linear foot of horizontal well. So that's a lot of sand. Typical hydraulic fracturing jobs require about 2,500 gallons of fracturing fluid with all the additives inside, also per linear foot, which is a lot of water too. And if you make some numbers, if you divide, for example, the amount of sand divided the amount of, uh, of water per linear foot, you find out that in these typical jobs, you have about one pound of sand per gallon. That's a mixture. And in volumetric terms, this is about 70%. So it's a relatively uh, dispersed mixture. Seven. Uh, seven. So, you know, if, if you had a lot more than that, then the, the, the sand will start touching with each other and it wouldn't flow that well. And just one more thing from the technical aspect is that uh, usually when you do this hydraulic fracture in injection, you start injecting at the beginning fracturing fluid. So this will be zero. At some point, you stop. And this is going to be the rate of injection. And let's just think. Uh, how would you inject this? How would you inject the propant? From the very beginning with the fluid, from the fracture with the fracturing fluid, or after some time? Why? Why would you do that? Easier for? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, well, it's going to be a combination of the, you better have first a fracture open in order to have the sand to go in. Otherwise, there is no place for the sand. There's also some of these people that argue that, that some uh, particles can inhibit fracture growth. So usually what you do is you leave some time uh, without injecting any propant, and then you ramp up the propant in steps till the maximum. So this is going to be the total injection, and this is going to be the rate of injection of the propant. And, and this is this what This region that goes in here is called the path. It's a region in which, or the time for which, you're not injecting uh, any propane. Here, a path, PAD. Um, I heard recently that there were some people injecting 
uh, fracking without a path. And that sounds a little bit strange to me. Uh, but probably what they're meaning is that when after you do a stage and you do a backflow water that may be already filled you know, with something which is not a lot of propane, so all that volume, they may use that as a path and then inject the propane from the beginning, but uh, always you're gonna have some region in which you have almost no propane at all, just fracturing fluid, you open a fracture, and then you do, uh, you start uh, injecting uh, your propane. There are some people that even in the path, they add some other uh, fluids like acids in order to, to make uh, fracture operation easier at the beginning. So if you had an acid, what do you think you would do? What are you going to affect in this problem of hydraulic fracture propagation? Probably, but with young modules, I mean, the young modules, remember, it, it plays a big role on the net pressure, but it's mostly on the intact rock. What is the property that injecting an acid could, could lower, could the decrease? Toughness. The toughness. So if you inject an acid, then at the tip of the, your perforations, you can make that uh, initial fracture uh, to propagate a lot easier if your toughness is, uh, is lower. All right. So, all right, guys. I think th that's, that's it for today. And uh, then we'll finish this topic on Wednesday. Uh, and if you have any questions about your project, uh, please uh, uh, go to my office now during, during office uh, hours, okay? I'm going to be there. All right. Okay. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.